It's 10 years since China launched its massive global infrastructure project, the Belt and Road Initiative. This week, representatives from more than 100 countries are gathering in Beijing to discuss the scheme, which has seen China lend billions of dollars to poorer nations, often with strict repayment conditions attached. The initiative, widely seen as a way for Beijing to assert its geopolitical might, comes against the backdrop of the devastating conflict in Israel, as well as Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine. To talk more about the state of the project and how it could shape Chinese-Russian ties, I'm joined now by China analyst Fraser Howey. Fraser, good to have you with us. A decade on, how close is the Belt and Road today to what China originally envisioned? Well, I think that's the, the problem. I'm not sure they, they, they're sure themselves what they envisioned. That we talk about the 10-year anniversary, and this is this is almost putting a, a substance to it after the fact, because, of course, 10 years ago, it wasn't the Belt and Road Initiative. It was called One Belt, One Road. Um, and even before that, it was really an amalgam of a whole host of projects that China had been developing across the what was generally seen as the Global South, and trying to cement global uh, geopolitical relations and trade relationships. So it's, I think, to call it a direct project as if this was some great plan that the Chinese had almost gives it too much, uh, too much credibility. It was much more a hodgepodge of different things coming together under effectively a marketing brand. OK, so this project is very difficult to define, it seems, but we hear a lot about what it may mean for other countries. I'm interested in the view from within China, though, especially against a backdrop of a slowing economy. How do people there view this project? I think that's very important because, of course, 10 years ago, the Chinese economy was much stronger. The geopolitical position of China was much stronger. The, the, the Belt and Road Initiative um, was seen as a, you know, very much a, a, a geopolitical force or, or tool that China could use to help cement its relationships with many countries. And of course, it wasn't just infrastructure building. It was also political tie-ups and hoping that these countries would follow China and its voting at the UN and, and things like that. Um, and things have changed dramatically over the past 10 years. I think two things are worth pointing out, though that there's actually been a lack of really strong directives within China. While there's lots of supporting documents, there is no grand policy of Chinese government instructing local governments or entities to go out and actively support the, the Belt and Road Initiative. And so therefore, especially now, there's a lot of caution from invest or, uh, from companies and local governments in China. They're just much more cautious about you know, spending a lot of money in faraway places when they're struggling themselves. So I wouldn't say it's opposition to the project, but it is certainly being wound down, or it's being wound back, certainly, because China simply doesn't have that much uh, capacity to continue to fund these projects. How does a winding down of a project like this look in concrete terms, though? I think it just means that less things are being built. You know, that this was very much China going out, it was going to build railways, it was going to build roads, it was going to build bridges and ports. Um, and that was going to be happening in dozens, if not, you know, over 100 countries. And what you'll see is a lot of that ambition is going to be scaled back, that the size of the deals are smaller, there's going to be fewer deals. Um, and so that's what it simply means, that China simply will not commit the same amount of time and effort and ultimately funding. But a key, a, a key thing to remember here as well, it's it's often been presented as somehow this is China's gift to the to its trade partners or the global south of the developing world. And that's simply not true. These are commercial loans that are being offered by China. There's very little freebies being offered here. And in fact, there's generally a lot of um, ties and, and strings attached to these deals. Can you give us some concrete examples of some of these commercial loans going wrong? Well, I think there, there, there's many cases. And I, 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 I think there's certainly some in, West, in East Africa. There's some in Europe as well, uh, again, where the basically come uh, the projects are simply not funding themselves you know if you build a port or if you build a road or a bridge and it's tolls to basically fund the cost of that there's simply are not enough people using it it's not basically got enough traffic um, and so therefore those projects uh, fail to get bring the return that they wanted now this is of course exactly what we saw in china domestically as well where there was a huge infrastructure build out 
with the belief that if you build it, they will come, that this will generate more trade, this will generate more footfall, more traffic, et cetera, more tolls. And it's often not worked out like that. In some areas, it's worked very well. But often when you get in China into the interior provinces or you get to parts of the developing world which are simply not rich enough, you're simply not going to generate the returns which are going to pay back the huge costs of building a six-lane highway you know, in Sri Lanka, say, to from the airport to this, uh, the suburbs of the capital, or indeed in Mauritius, again, where they've built a huge airport and expressway, which simply doesn't have the traffic to justify the costs. And this isn't only about uh, physical infrastructure, is it? Digital infrastructure is part of this project as well. Very much so. So this is what I was saying, there are strings attached. This isn't just the case of China coming and saying, I'm going to build a bridge for you or improve your road quality. It's tying you into often Chinese um, technology infrastructure, which, of course, can be very appealing for countries which are very poor technology infrastructure. But it does mean that China has tremendous control over uh, ultimately your communications. And we've seen this in particularly with Pakistan, where China has taken tremendous control um, over much of the, the infrastructure in terms of technology um, in Pakistan. And that has caused a lot of ill feeling and political problems domestically for that country. So China likes to think itself as some, uh, this is all positive, a win-win for all sides, but it certainly causes a lot of domestic stresses as well for the recipient countries. Let's look more closely at geopolitics now. President Putin has done very little foreign travel since the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for him. How significant is his appearance at this forum? Um, I think it's uh, very significant. It very much uh, is, uh, is China and Russia thumbing its nose at the West. Um, and while China talks about neutrality and a peaceful solution, it clearly is supporting Russia, maybe not directly with arms, but the very fact that it will host Russia, that business continues, and in fact, Russia has become more dependent on China. Um, it, I think it sends a very poor signal for China's role in the world, that it may dislike the current order, but what it's basically ushering in is a period of disorder, not a multipolar world, but a period of disorder, where basically um, countries like Russia are can have this adventurism, and they'll know that China basically has their back. So to some extent, this is a mutually dependent relationship. Where would you say the balance of power is, though? It's very difficult to say. I think everyone talks about Russia becoming a, a, a vassal state of China. Um, but the trouble is, I'm not sure how much power China has to really influence Russia. Um, I, I think it was taken completely off guard by the Ukrainian invasion. Um, and if Putin had given them the heads up, I think they, they completely misunderstood what they were being told, or Putin just didn't understand, of course, what he was getting into. So it's, you think China has the, the driving seat because it's keeping the, the Russian economy afloat, but I think it's far more problematic than that because countries like Russia, and I think you'll see probably with Iran and North Korea as well, other countries that China is very close to, are just going to continue to cause problems in their local regions, which will have problems globally. Um, and China is able to do very little. And so it struggles and it talks about neutrality and everyone should be nice to each other and stop fighting. But the reality is that China is so, not facilitated, but certainly is doing very little to, to rein in some of these rogue actors. Let's look at a concrete issue now. Putin and Xi are reportedly planning to talk about the idea of settling debts in national currencies. How significant a move would that be for the Belt and Road more generally? Um, this is always difficult to know ultimately who the hell we want to take your rubles. You know, it's all we're all talking about settling in your local currency. Um, but you, many of these countries have, poor, have weak currencies because the political and financial infrastructure is so poor. Even settling in renminbi, um, the trouble there, of course, is that China is a restrict. The renminbi is a restricted currency. It's only basically used to buy things from China, which is fine, but effectively becomes almost like a barter form of relationship between the two countries. Um, China, of course, there, uh, has restricted the use of the renminbi literally for 30 years, and certainly the currency is underused relative to size of the economy. But this isn't a threat to the dollar. The systems are operating very differently. Um, I think, though, the Americans need to be careful that they don't weaponize the dollar too much. I think one of the great strengths is that everybody uses it and everybody wants to use it. I think, actually, Argentina is a better example, which is, again, a Belt and Road partner, um, has large swap lines um, between Argentina and China. 
and yet the the one of the leading politicians there is calling for dollarization. And indeed, they want to spend their RMB because they don't want to spend their US dollars. So there's still a lot of work and distance to go before China is anyway um, threatening the dollar and the current financial arrangements. The two countries have been strengthening their ties, though, recently. How would you assess the economic relationship? Um, obviously, it is very strong. Russia has become highly dependent on them. China has made no... Uh, no uh, qualms about buying, continuing to buy Russian hydrocarbons. You look at their trade balances, they've increased tremendously. I think that's only going to increase uh, whatever happens with the Ukraine war. I think the the Russia's economic relationships are clearly going to change for many years to come. So they're going to become ever more dependent on, on China. Um, although I think that will, like say this, th these countries fundamentally don't trust one another. Their, their commonality at the moment is a dislike of the West and, a, and an obsession about America. Um, and I think ultimately they will run into problems as well because it is an uneven relationship. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it all seems all happy and all singing, all clapping at the moment, but there's going to be problems down the line. I want to talk about another set of representatives who will be at this event, and that is the Taliban. Um, what does this tell us about the kind of relationships China is forging as part of this project? Well, look, you've got to remember that the, the Afghanistan is, you know, a, uh, shares a border with China. Um, and it's the Taliban runs Afghanistan. That's just the reality. And the Chinese, when it comes to dealing with governments, have basically no standards. They will deal with whoever's in power. Um, and so they are very worried that the Taliban the Islamic extremists will come over from Afghanistan and cause problems in Xinjiang. We already know there's a cultural genocide being perpetrated there. And so China is, it's a very realpolitik approach to dealing with governments in power. Um, but again, if they choose not to deal with the Taliban, then, you know, what do you do? They are a neighbor of Afghanistan, not a problem the American side, not the problem the Europeans have. But of course, as well, uh, China is looking for uh, raw minerals, raw materials, raw minerals, and Afghanistan has many of those commodities that China wants, and it's going to try and exploit that relationship um, and uh, get access to those materials. Great, so we have to mention as well that this meeting is happening under the shadow of a devastating conflict in Israel. Can we expect a statement from China about this at the Belt and Road Forum? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect too much from them. They've already made relatively weak statements. Uh, they didn't criticize Hamas in their original opening statement. The Israeli embassy at Beijing said they expected a stronger statement. China has always tried to be a great friend to Israel and certainly wants a lot of Israeli tech. They've talked, uh, Wang Yi, their foreign minister, talked just recently how Israel had probably gone too far um, in terms of what it's doing to Gaza in terms of the humanitarian crisis. Um, so I don't think we're going to see particularly strong statements there. Again, China is very reluctant to take sides, even though they clearly do take sides, as the Ukraine conflict has shown. Um, they will come out and they will talk about reducing harm and reducing civilian casualties, which in themselves are all very important things. But I think this really shows the limit of China's geopolitical abilities. While they can host large meetings in Beijing and bring everybody together and, and fly everybody's flag and make everybody feel special, the reality of China being able to change things on the ground, whether it be in the Middle East or in Ukraine, is very, very limited. What about the future, though? How do you see the Belt and Road shaping China's global influence, say, a decade from now? Yeah, I think it, it, it is interesting. Clearly, it's had, you know, in certain projects, it's been very successful. It's, um, it's expanded their reach. It's given them cover, as it were, or given them a purpose to go out and do many of these things. I think, though, we should keep things in perspective. As I say, they, they are running into problems with their own economy. Their ability to continue to fund this or want their willingness to fund it is going to be limited because they're going to run into more and more problems in terms of uh, just capacity and the ability of these projects to pay. Um, but they will try and milk it for all it's worth. I think it's more publicity. And as I say, it gives them a banner to go in with and almost like a marketing tool. Uh, so in that sense, they will it will continue, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily draw, uh, you know, I don't think it's any magic wand or silver bullet 
to China's geopolitical ambitions.